you church for your prayers while I was away this past week in California it was a real fruitful time I really uh, felt your prayers I was able to make great connections with beautiful churches and uh, more than I even thought was going to be possible uh, I was in front of uh, men of God who are making a huge difference in the city of California. I actually got to meet in person um, a man by the name of Raul Reese. He's a pastor now, but used to be a very broken man. And I saw his movie when I was a young teen going to church. We use that movie to reach many young people for Christ. The movie is called From Fury to Freedom. It's a true story. You can go on YouTube and see it. It's a very powerful testimony. And then I made the connection when I met him and heard his testimony. I said, wait, that's, that's the, the testimony of the movie that we used to watch when we were younger. And so I called and, and through another person asked if, to see if I could meet him. And he graciously uh, received me to meet him. And it was just such a powerful connection. Uh, he, he, he's the pastor of Calvary Chapel in Golden Springs, California. And his church has uh, become a, a wonderful testimony of the power of God. Thousands of people go to his church. And he used to be a very broken man, very angry. Uh, at the point when he got converted, the very same day that he got converted, that same day, he was planning to take the life of his wife and his kids and then take his own life. That's how bad he had come. That point of great desperation, a lot of anger, alcoholic father. There's a broken home. And so I think that testimony was preparing my heart to share this message with you today. And I've titled my message for you, uh, my dear brothers, have a manly, have a manly fight. Every man needs to have a manly fight. And I'm not talking about a fist fight where you are trying to prove how strong you are. It's not an ego trip that I'm talking about. I'm talking about a fight that keeps you alive, that keeps you in the course, and it keeps you loyal to God. Because every man at some point in his life is going to encounter a fight well, you're going to want to quit and you want to shut out and forget about it all. Isolate from the people that you love and just do it on your own. But God wants you to know how to fight when the fight comes to you. When the temptation knocks at your door that wants to take you out and make you an addicted man or an angry man. That's when the battle really begins. Some men start fighting as early as the time of their conception in their mother's womb. The fight begins to some men there because there is a conflict of interest about you, whether or not to have you. And believe it or not, the tension is felt in the womb. The unwanted child feels unwanted in the womb and your, fi your fight started there. Some men fight a little later in life when they go to school and they have to fight the labels placed on them maybe the bullies at school or maybe even a dysfunctional home where there is violence and like Raul Reese he had to face an alcoholic father who would come and beat up his mother and trash her with words and he had to watch that as a little kid and the anger that started brewing in this young man's heart so angry that he went into martial arts to try to defend his mother. And he vowed that if he would be touched by his father, he said, I'd, I'd kill you. That's how angry he was. When that fight comes to a man, I want to show you today through a story of King David how to be able to fight back and win the fight, a godly fight, a manly fight. Because all of you, are fighting something or have fought something or are about to fight something that can take you out. Regret can take you out. Did you know that every day 20 veterans take their lives? Every day, today, 20 men are going to take their lives right here in the United States. 
because their fight started when they came back from war and there's trauma and they can't adjust and they lose the fight some of you are fighting shame some of you are fighting regret of the things that have happened and you feel like your heart has nothing you, you don't know how to feel you don't know how to love you you feel like you failed your family and that's a fight because that can take you out maybe not take your life but you would completely disengage from involving yourself in relationship with those that need you maybe it was a divorce when you were growing up and that was the fight that took you out and your heart is bitter and you're growing with a bitter heart with an angry heart and you can see that through the words you say through the actions you do through the movies you watch through the video games you play and God is talking to you young man that he wants to heal your heart and he wants to teach you how to fight so you don't end up being another statistic of an angry man who doesn't know how to relate to people and that breaks everything that he buys with his own money <laughs> maybe it's the loss of a job or this lawless culture that is inviting men to reconsider their gender isn't it amazing that boys today are not even safe because the options of them in their moment of weakness reconsidering whether or not they're men maybe you're a woman the confusion that's coming against the male and the female as well is without any precedence we see it more than ever before in most moments I want to share with you all the males here that you don't have to be a casualty of war that you can win this battle if you follow simply the instructions of God there's too much pain in this world but there's a lot of God also in this world that you can't take a hold of to help you restore your heart the story begins in first Samuel chapter 30 and that's where I want you to turn in your Bibles first Samuel 30 would you go there please if you have your Bible or if you have your electronic device if you can go there I'm reading from the New Living Translation As I read this story, I believe the Lord's going to be speaking clearly to you. Some of you will be saved from calamity because of this message. Listen carefully. I really pray the young men here are listening. There's a beauty about being young. It's that you haven't blown it so much yet. But you can if you're not careful. I mean, isn't that? Yeah, it's beautiful. The biggest trauma is, you know, probably that you lost your Lego or you dropped your ice cream. But truly, I want you to listen carefully. Listen, this is God's word for you. God is loving you. And if you're old and you've gone through things, I want you to listen because you can be restored. And God can write something new in your life. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. I want you to have a heart that believes. Before we begin to read, I want to give you a little bit of context. For the young people here, this is a favorite story of yours. David, King David, was the second king of Israel. He just recently killed Goliath. He was the champion of the Philistines. A big dude who was terrorizing the people of Israel. Young David, who loved the Lord, did not fear this giant, took him out, threw a stone in his forehead and killed him and chopped off the head of this Philistine. Young David, powerful victory. And then the whole nation started celebrating and saying a little song that said, Saul, which was the first king of Israel, has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. Because that day was a great victory for Israel. And it was instrumented by this young boy who believed the Lord and did not let this giant taunt him. Right after that happened, King Saul began to have a jealous eye for David, and he was jealous, and he tried to kill him several times. Jealousy can lead you to murder somebody, to hate somebody, to try to do harm to them, and Saul got jealous of David. So David started running away. He went to the desert. He started hiding in caves. 
hiding for his life. He didn't do anything to Saul, but he was so jealous that he couldn't be in his presence. And then one day, David had this idea. He was so fed up with Saul following him and persecuting him, he was distraught, he was weary about it, and he had this idea to go into the enemy's camp and hide himself in the camp of the Philistines, the very enemies of Israel, the very guy that he just killed from the Philistine army. Now he's going back to the Philistines and seeking asylum with King Achish from, from, from Negev. And so he says to the king, I'm going to be loyal to you. If I hide in the enemies of Israel, Saul will never find me here. And it kind of worked because Saul never intended to find him there. It was a good plan. And so King Achish began to trust David. And when they would go into battle one day, David went with them. But some of the governors of the Philistine army said, we don't want David with us. What if he turns his heart in the middle of battle and ends up fighting for Israel and then we get all defeated? We don't want him to fight with us. That's a strategy. He's really smart. Don't bring him. So the king said, no, he's been really loyal for years. He's been hiding here. He's been going out there and doing battles on his own and he seems to bring a good report. Let him come. No, we don't want him here. Let him go back to the city that you gave him, which was called Siklag, in the Philistine camp. So the king says, David, I'm sorry. They're not going to let you fight with us. Go back early in the morning. Take your 600 men. That's, that's the amount of people he came with to hide in the Philistine army. And so David came back three days after. He came back to Siklag, and this is exactly where the story picks up. Verse 1 of chapter 30 of 1 Samuel says, There, excuse me, these days, got it wrong again, three days later, when David and his men arrived home at their town of Siklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid into the Negev and Siklag, and they had crushed Siklag and burned it to the ground. They had carried off the women and the children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, verse 4 it says, they wept until they could weep no more. David's two wives, Ahinoam from Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal from Carmel, were among those captured. David was now in great danger. Other translations say David was greatly distressed. Not just distressed, but greatly distressed. Because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters. And they began to talk of stoning him. So that's the situation that David ha finds himself. He wakes up that day not knowing that this would be the fight of his life. His own people want to kill him. All the children have been kidnapped. All the women have been taken away. And the city that he was living in was completely burnt. So you've lost pretty much everything. Think about that. You come back from work. Your house is burnt. Your children are taken. Your wife is taken. And then your relatives and your uh, associates want to kill you because they make you responsible for the demise. And he wakes up to that reality. That day was a very bad day in David's life. Don't you agree? He was greatly distressed. I mean, there was a time when I took my family to Hampton Beach and I lost my son Juan for a few minutes. It was a few minutes and it felt like eternity. And you begin to hyperventilate. You think you lost your son. Am I ever going to find him? You start running. I mean, to lose your family is a very hard thing. Finally, we found him. Later, he was, he was crying. And there, this lady was just asking. And funny that that happened to each and every one of our kids at Hampton Beach. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> 
But we found them, each and every one of them. <laughs> to lose your family and to lose everything you have as a man is a very hard thing. And this is what David was going through. Maybe you have lost your marriage. Maybe you have lost your children. Maybe you are in a process where the love of your family is not with you. And that's a very painful thing. There are countless custody battles happening in this nation right now where fathers are taken away from their families and courts remove the fathers from their children. And in many cases, more than you would even imagine, there was truly not an in-depth research as to what the situation really was. And the punishment is worse than the condition they're trying to keep the kids from when they remove a father from a home. Recently in the United States, there was a case of a young man who was very attached to his son. And he'd always been close to him. This is just one of many stories. There was a custody dispute. He did get to see his son, but gradually the child had been alienated by his mother against the father. Finally, the ex-wife went to the Supreme Court and had the child's name changed to the child so the child couldn't even have the father's name. The father had, had a breakdown. This is a very horrible outcome. He shot his son and he shot himself. And then you wonder, what happens in a man's heart when he ends up doing something like this? He's lost the fight. The pain and the distress is so great that they can't handle it. And they take their lives and do harm to those around them. But sometimes the origin of our distress is many times found in our disobedience. David was actually in Ziklag through disobedience because he didn't trust the Lord. And he himself brought himself to that situation. Would you agree that most of the time, not every time, but most of the time, our distress can find its roots in our disobedience? At some point, we disobeyed God. And we didn't trust God, and we didn't ask of Him, is this what you want me to do? And we relied in our own understanding, and we did something that sounded good, it looked good, but it was not God's plan. And in that moment, we find ourselves in great distress. You rewind the tape, and there might be a time when you just lost connection with God, and you did not ask Him, you did not depend. And David did that because he was so tired, like I told you, of running from Saul that he stopped inquiring the Lord this time around. If you go a few chapters before in chapter 27, the first verse, it says, One day David kept thinking to himself, Someday Saul is going to get me. And the best thing I can do is escape to the Philistines. Then Saul will stop hunting me in Israelite territory and I will finally be safe. The problem was that he never asked the Lord about that. He did it in his own understanding and he went ahead and went back into the enemy's camp to find comfort and safeguard from his enemy. It's just not going to work. And many times if you fail to find comfort in God, you fail to find refuge in God, you're, you're going to find it somewhere else. But the moment you remove yourself from the counsel of God to do what comes right into your own eyes, you abandon the plot of God and you start writing your own story. And then God has to come and rescue you from that in His kindness. And that's exactly what he did with David. As we continue to read the story, you're going to see that David was rejected by the Philistines and was not allowed to fight with them. 
as God trying to block him from joining forces with the enemy. Because what if he would have fought against Saul and his son Jonathan and killed the very king of Israel by having joined the Philistines? That would have been a horrible thing for David to go through. But God was putting him away. He, he's experiencing rejection from the very world that he's seeking comfort from. And sometimes God will allow the very things that you're falling in love with to reject you. Because it's God's plan to get you back on track with his plan. And the Philistines are saying, what are these Hebrews doing here? <coughs> if I can have a little bit more gain on this mic. <coughs> Thank you. As if the enemy say, why is David behaving like one of us? And the world will sometimes ask Christians, why are these so-called Christians asking, acting like we are? What are you doing here? And that's God's way of using the world to bring some conviction in your life to say that you don't belong there, that God has called you to be loyal to God, to serve God, and to be in His will. God will use the most incredible things to get back your attention and bring you back into devotion with God. It is amazing how many stories I've heard of the friends that I had in high school. They were getting so much satisfaction from the world. I'm going to ask the young men there if they can help me preach this word, all right? So if you can encourage each other to pay attention. And some of the young adults, if you can help them and father them into this season of their lives to pay attention to the word. It's so important for their lives. The enemy will use anything to get you away from the plans of God. But God will even use the enemy to get you back on track with his plans. The origin of distress, yes, it can be our disobedience. But many times, the origin of our distress is the disobedience of others. It is the darkness of someone else who harms you. The depravity of someone else. The dishonesty and the deception of somebody else. You did nothing. You were just doing the right thing. You are just being a kid. And like Laura was sharing her testimony, sometimes darkness comes. Not out of place of personal direct disobedience, but from the disobedience of someone else. And you did nothing to cause it. It just came upon you. And there you find yourself entangled by a cloud of darkness and wickedness through the hands of people that are far from God. Whether it's distress coming from your disobedience or someone else's, the answer continues to be one and the same. Jesus Christ is the only one who can redeem you. And you need to call on His name. And like David, never do anything without consulting God. You don't have to remain bound. and You don't have to stay bound. You can go to God and say like she was reading, Laura, 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 was reading, Laura was reading, the time is now for you to call on me, to trust in me alone. So in that place where David finds himself greatly distressed, from that place of disobedience to God, if you dig deeper, Beneath the disobedience, there's something even worse. And it's a doubtful heart. When you doubt the Lord, you disobey the Lord. And when you disobey the Lord, you experience distress. So I like to say, be afraid of staying afraid. Because when you are afraid and you stay afraid, your faith begins to die out. And when faith begins to die out, fear enters your heart. And when you act in fear, you are 
very open to the floods of sin in your life. A soul that doubts the Lord is a soul that will begin to do things that will hurt them outside of the plans of God. Are you doubting God? Do you doubt of His care for your life? Do you doubt that He will ever restore you? Restore what the enemy took from you? Doubt your doubts. Amen? And begin to trust God and listen to what God has to say to you this morning so that faith can keep you in His ways. Because fear will keep you out of His ways. Thankfully, God blocked David's progress and He protected him from total destruction and shame. And I want you to see, dear man, this morning what David did to handle this moment of distress. And this is where your godly, manly fight begins. The first thing he does, as we continue to read in verse, the end of verse 5. If you follow with me, right after his people are trying to stone him and kill him, it says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. The first thing, man, that you need to do is to find strength in the Lord. I want you to tell the person next to you, find strength in the Lord. Go ahead and tell that person. Look at him and say that to him. Say that to her. Find strength in the Lord. Be encouraged in the Lord. And David came to a point where he had nobody to encourage him. Everybody left him. And he had no one to help him. And there's nothing wrong when a man has to encourage himself. The problem is when he encourages himself outside of the Lord. The legal way to handle your moment of distress and your biggest fight in your marriage or at work or in your personal life is that rather to encourage yourself outside the Lord, you encourage yourself in the Lord. And there are several ways to do that. The first way to do that is to refuse the idea of falling away from God. When I've been discouraged, here's the first temptation. Stop reading your Bible. Stop praying. You're too overwhelmed to go to God. Sometimes men will be so discouraged that they'll not come to church altogether. And they're so overwhelmed, they'll just stay in the basement. That's another way to say that a man is going back to his crib. That's not a good way to fight. To isolate, to find encouragement in pornography, or to find encouragement in buying something new, or going out to drink with your buddies. The Bible says that a man needs to find his encouragement in God. And when so the temptation comes when you just don't want to have anything to do with the Lord. That's when you need to come to Him and continue to pray and continue to read His Word and continue to come to church, continue to be in fellowship with other brothers. The whispers of the enemy will say, Duh, you don't need that. Just, just get away from everything. Just be alone. Don't let anybody bother you. And that's such a horrible strategy because it makes you an independent island where the enemy can actually take you out. But the moment you go back into fellowship and you continue to persevere, the Lord will give you His grace and bring you back into a place of sanity. Another way that works really well to encourage yourself in the Lord is simply to talk to God. 
don't stop talking to him. Look at what David said in Psalm 31, 9 through 11, which is a pretty good reflection of what he's going through right here. He says to the Lord, have mercy on me, Lord, for I am in distress. Tears blur my eyes. My body and soul are withering away. I am dying from grief. My years are shortened by sadness, and sin has drained my strength. I am wasting away from within. I am scorned by all my enemies and despised by my neighbors. Even my friends are afraid to come near me. When men go silent, they begin to suffer hopelessly in distress. You cannot go silent. You have to talk to God. You have to open up your mouth and begin to talk to God. Even bring to Him your depression. Tell Him exactly how you're feeling. Lord, I'm sad. Lord, I feel like I don't have what it takes to take one more step. Lord, I'm being tempted. Lord, I can't understand what's going on. I need you. Talk to Him. I find myself talking to the Lord about the big and the small stuff all the time. Keep talking. Keep expressing what's going on to the Lord. That is a wonderful way to encourage yourself in the Lord. The reason why there's a likeliness that men take their lives four times as much as women is because women can talk it out. And they can converse with their friends and share their struggles. It's easier for them, but we get silent. And we begin to go through it by ourselves and find refuge in our work, find refuge in drugs, find refuge in things that simply will take us out. You can't find refuge in the enemy's camp. You cannot go back to the Philistine army that represents the enemy to find comfort for your soul. You can't find it in the bar. You can't find it in food or isolate yourself in work to run away from a horrible situation at home. You must find your encouragement in God because He cares for you and He loves you and He will build you up. You can also encourage yourself by speaking Scripture to yourself. One of my favorite verses is, He who began the good work will finish it until the day of Jesus. Listen carefully, my dear brothers and sisters. Speak to yourself the Word of God. When I feel like I want to quit, I tell the Lord, Show me some words that I can speak to myself. And I say, Juan, he who, be, who began the good work in you is going to finish it. He's not going to leave you unfinished. So hang in there because there's work to do. The Lord has more in store for you. Just watch and see what he's going to do. He's going to paint something beautiful. I know it feels dark. I know it feels hopeless right now. I know you want to check out, but he who began the good work is going to finish it. One, remember that. And I speak to myself, and I prophesy to myself the word of the Lord. Another good passage that I quote to myself, and I was sharing that with Laura and Robert yesterday, is he who began the good work in me. No, excuse me. I said that already. Just trying to check if you're paying attention. <laughs> he who is in me is much greater than he who is in, in the world. Hallelujah. So when all hell rises up to squeeze the life out of you, to put you under the thumb of darkness where you see no way out, you need to talk to yourself the scripture and declare, He who is inside of me is greater, so much greater than he who is in the world. Get ye behind me, Satan. 
I belong to Jesus, and Jesus lives in me, and he will help me conquer this through his power. Hallelujah. And another one that I love to quote to myself is everything, everything I go through works for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. When I was coming back from California, I was supposed to be back on Thursday at 12 noon. My flight got postponed and then it was closed. And there was about six people with me that were very angry and upset about it. I wanted to get home. It was a long week, a lot of work. And I was considering why would they not let us go inside the plane when it's right there and just bring us back home like they say they would, right? We paid and we should be able to go. And I was encountered with such meanness at the counter. They won't even look at your eye. I don't know if that's the latest customer service strategy to ignore you. I guess it works because, you know, what else can you do but find another flight. You're not going to walk back, right? <laughs> you depend on them. It's very sad, though. So I had a choice to be frustrated or simply quote to myself the scripture, everything works for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so I said to some of the guys that were there, listen, you know, one guy specifically said, I wasted this whole time. I come from Austin and they're sending me back to Austin. This is terrible. This is crazy. And I just look at him and say, listen, let's not waste this. Let's just get to meet each other and let's talk. Let's make this moment count. You met me. That's a good thing. And she kind of chuckled. And we walked around the airport and we ended up sleeping in the airport the next day. It was in a standby flight at 6 in the morning. And I was saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that this is not going to beat me. This is, this is a little fight, but it's not going to take me out. Because I thank you. Maybe the, the, the flight that I was going to take was going to crash. You spared my life. Maybe my wife, when she was going to go pick me up, she would have fallen asleep. Who knows what you spared her from? So I praise you, Jesus, and I thank you that I have a place to sleep. The airport is all for myself. Praise the Lord. I'm going to pretend and think this is my house. I like my house. Nice, tall roof. Beautiful. Amen. <laughs> It got me a Milky Way, a milk, and I ate it, half of it, showed it to my daughters. And I beat the discouragement, the moment of distress. Now that could be a little example, but that can escalate, right, to a point that it, it, can, it can actually take you out. But you can also encourage yourself in the Lord by speaking to yourself. Yes, I said that. I think sometimes the most sane thing to do is to speak to yourself. If all you do is speak to other people and you never speak to yourself, you're out of your mind. <laughs> David did that many times. An example, in Psalm 43, 5, he says, Why are you so discouraged, O my soul? Why are you so downcast? Why are you so restless? Put your hope in God, because I will still praise Him. He is my Savior and my God. And sometimes you need to tell your soul, knock it off. Stop the whining. Stop the pity party. Stop playing the victim. Rise up, O oh soul. Put your hope in God. Submit to the plan of God. Stop whining, O oh soul. Why are you so sad and downcast? Put your hope in the Lord. Amen? Have you talked to your soul lately? You need to talk to yourself. Give yourself a little smack on the face. Put yourself a little bit of boundary, a punch of truth to your heart comes the right time to make you sober-minded and keep you from staying in that place. Some people stay in that place of misery for years. Some men have st remained stuck in that place for years. And they're blaming everybody for their sadness and their demise. And they're angry at everybody. They have no peace in their heart because in their mind they never spoke to their soul some truth 
and they believe the lie that everybody is out to get them. You ladies, you can also get there. Everybody's out there to get you. And you will stay there in that place of the mice because you never came to the Lord to encourage yourself in the Lord, to talk to the Lord, to read His Word, to speak and prophesy the Word of God upon your life, and to speak some wisdom into your soul. And David encouraged himself in the Lord when he had nothing else left. I pray that as the Lord gives me the privilege of shepherding this flock, that you will become an expert in encouraging yourself in the Lord. Don't wait for someone else to come alongside. That's great when it comes. But if you stay there waiting, you could wait for years before it comes. You need to take responsibility of your own walk with the Lord and begin to feed yourself some encouragement. Amen? That's going to help you come out of that place of distress and make it through the other side. As we continue to read, I want you to see what else happens. But David found strength in the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Verse 7, Then he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought it. And then David asked the Lord, Should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, Yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. The next thing, my brothers, that you and I need to learn how to do is, and it sounds very simple, so don't dismiss it for the simplicity of this phrase. Don't just encourage yourself in the Lord. The next thing you need to do is you need to seek guidance from the Lord. You need to seek guidance from the Lord. You need to ask him, what do I do now? So the battle didn't take you out. You're encouraged. You're not going to do something stupid. You take care of that first problem. You're encouraged in the Lord. You have hope in the Lord. The Lord has spoken some sense into your soul. But now you need to ask God, what now, Lord? What is my next day going to look like? What is my next month going to look like? How do I recover everything the enemy took from me? And David is asking, what do I do? Everything has been taken away from me. The enemy has stolen from me. What do I do? Show me how to recover what I've lost. Show me, Lord Jesus, how to get whole again. And you listen to what I'm saying. You can't do it on your own strength. You need the Lord to guide you, to seek guidance from the Lord. One of my favorite verses, and I read it to Leilani this morning as a gift to her life, her beautiful life. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. And here's the key word. Seek His will in all you do. And He will show you which path to take. He's going to show you what path to take. So you need to seek Him to get the answers from Him. There was a moment in my life when I needed so much guidance. This hit my heart in a very tender spot as a man, as a father, as a husband. A man that entered our lives that hurt one of my daughters very deeply. I've never spoken about this till this day to you in a corporate setting. I wanted so bad to hurt this person. I wanted so bad for justice to be done. I said, Lord, I'm serving you. I'm working for you. 
And here comes a man who has no understanding of your ways to hurt what is most precious to me. When a father cannot protect what is his, there's a feeling of great helplessness that grips your heart. And it was in that moment when I needed the Lord the most. And I'm thankful that I sought the Lord. I sought the Lord and He answered me. And He spoke to me and He told me, leave it up to me. Don't take matters in your own hands. Do not touch Him. Rather, bless Him. And we came to the point with my wife where we both came to a place of repentance for allowing in our hearts the right to be angry against this person and to even desire some justice. It was not our place to do that. And so the Lord told me that He would do it, that He would take care of the situation, and that we needed to simply forgive and adopt Him as our Son. That's exactly what He spoke to my heart. I've journaled it. When the Lord spoke to me that day, I felt a freedom in my spirit and a freedom in my heart. A meeting was arranged and we were able with my wife to forgive him, to pray for him. Tears went back and forth. It was a beautiful time where God brought us to a place where we were willing to bring him into our lives, to help him find the ways of the Lord. For many reasons that I don't understand, a few years, a few days later, he refused to follow through with this effort. And to this day, I pray that the Lord will have mercy in his life and restore this man's life. Restore this man's life. Who is Danny's father? And today is Father's Day, and I pray for that man. I don't control what God can do with this story. But I know that God has put compassion. In my heart. For this man. That is the power of God. For I called on the Lord and He answered me. And He gave me a word. And I obeyed Him. Like Jeremiah 33 3 says, Call out to me, and I will answer you. I will tell you great things, hidden things of which you are unaware. And it's beautiful when the Lord shows you the pain of another person. Because when He shows you the pain of someone else, your heart is gripped with compassion. And the vengeance is gone. And you leave matters into the hands of God. And He who is the creator of everything can do a much better job than you can. <laughs> Hallelujah. He can redeem the most horrible thing. And do something beautiful with it like he's doing with Laura and her husband he takes the despised and the trash of this world to shame the wise so we should never ever finish the story for God by entering into doubt and fear and taking matters into our own hands because we make a bigger mess when David ran away from the Lord and into the enemy's camp, the enemy came and took away everything he had. But he recuperated by starting with encouraging himself in the Lord. And then by calling on the name of his God to say, how do I fix this Lord? I brought my armies here and look at what I brought upon them. My disobedience brought this into my nation and these 600 men want to kill me. 
I need to encourage myself in the Lord. And I need to make things right. Lord, I'm calling the high priest. The ephod was the legal means through which God had authorized people to seek counsel from the Lord. And the priest would wear the ephod, which was a vest that he would put on his chest that had beautiful stones on it. And it was a representation of dependence on the Lord. And the Lord answered him and he said, and I love the words that he spoke to David because those same words the Lord has spoken to me in my moment of distress. And I know that the Lord, who is the restorer of all things, will restore what the enemy has taken away. How many of you believe that with me? How many of you know a God who is able to restore what the enemy took? If you can't believe that, I pray that God will give you faith. If you can see with your eyes the landscape in front of you, if God could do that, can He take care of you? And the Lord says, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken away from you. And that's what the Lord spoke to me. Everything that the enemy has taken away, I'll give it back to you. Go after it. Go after it. But you have to do it with my weapons. You have to come out of the enemy's camp. You have to leave hatred behind. You have to leave bitterness behind, insecurity behind, self-reliance behind. You trust in me. You trust in me, and I will do, says the Lord. For every young person here, you trust in the Lord. You go after his counsel because there will be friends in school that would lead you astray and tell you to find comfort in vaping, comfort in drugs, comfort in alcohol and illicit sex and you need to say no my comfort comes from the Lord my comfort comes from the maker of heaven and earth I know the words pastor has spoken these words to me my heart is fertile I'm not bearing I'm not unwise I'm not a fool I have the wisdom of God get ye behind me as a matter of fact why don't you come to church and I'll find you and I'll show you the one who can really give you comfort and you won't have a hang up or hang over the next day. But the Lord will give you more and more joy. Praise the Lord. Dear men, encourage yourself in the Lord and seek guidance from the Lord. God will reveal to you his way to spare you and to help you recover what, is, what was stolen. The next thing in our story, and I'm going to go a few, a few minutes over this morning, if you if will just uh, bear with me so I can close this in prayer with you. So David and his 600 men set out and they came to the brook of Bezor. But 200 of the men were too exhausted to cross the brook. So David continued to pursue the pursuit with 400 men. Along the way, they found an Egyptian man in a field and brought him to David. And they gave him some bread to eat and water to drink. They also gave him part of the thick cake and two clusters of raisins. Mm, I'm hungry now. <laughs> for he hadn't had anything to eat or drink for three days and nights. Before long, his strength returned. To whom? Do you belong and where do you come from? David asked. He, re he responded, I am an Egyptian, the slave an, of an Amalekite. Ooh, interesting. He's a slave of the very guys that raided the camp of Siklag. How convenient. My master abandoned me three days ago because I was sick. We were on our way back from raiding the Carathites in the Negev, the territory of Judah, and the land of Caleb. And we also had just burned Siklak. Bingo. This is the man that they needed to find. See, when, when you seek the Lord, He will guide your step and place you in front of the right person at the right time to get the right answer. Amen. The right person at the right time. This slave, this man who was a slave of the, Philist, of the, of the Philistines, excuse me, of the Amalekites, 
was discarded because he was sick. And he was the instrument God used to lead David to recover everything he had lost. So the story continues and David asked, will you lead me to this band of raiders? And the young man replied, if you take an oath in God's name that you will not kill me or give me back to my masters, then I will guide you to them. So he led David to them and they found the Amalekites spread out across the fields, eating and drinking and dancing with joy because of the vast amount of plunder they had taken from the Philistines and the land of Judah. But let me tell you that the laughing of the enemy has a time frame, okay? It's soon coming to an end. David and his men rushed in among them and slaughtered them throughout that night and the entire next day until evening. None of the Amalekites escaped except 400 young men who fled on camels. David got back everything the Amalekites had taken. Everything, okay? Notice that. And he rescued his two wives. By the way, as a side note, just because the Bible discloses the truth that David had two wives does not necessarily endorse it. Not everything the Bible reveals to be truth is truth to follow and principles to carry. He had two wives. That was not God's plan. God wants one woman for one man. Don't get any crazy ideas. David got back everything the Amalekites had taken and he rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, small or great, son or daughter, nor anything else that had been taken. David brought everything back. He also recovered all the flocks and herds and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock. The next thing, my brothers, that you and I need to do is to courageously and relentlessly pursue recovery to do everything you can to recover what the enemy has taken. Sometimes the enemy takes away your courage or your virginity or your purity. Sometimes he takes away your confidence. Sometimes your very own family. What I see in scripture is that once the Lord speaks and once the Lord directs, you need to courageously, no matter who goes with you, you need to do everything you can to recover your soul, to recover your sanity, to recover your mind, to recover what the enemy has taken from you. Others may give up along the way, and you may be the only one doing the right thing when nobody's doing it. See, 200 men gave up. They were too tired to go to rescue what was taken away. But David kept on going, and he took it all back through the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And I want to inspire you today that if you seek the Lord, you obey Him to the very end of your day and never get give up and never quit until you recover everything that was taken away from you. The Lord wants you whole. The Lord wants you healed. The Lord wants you restored. And He will give you the victory. But you have to be courageous and not grow weary in doing the right thing. And be open to the people that He will put in your path because many times your help will come from the most unlikely places like a slave, like a feeble person that may be inviting you to go back to the Lord. Don't dismiss those men and women of God who come alongside your life, men of peace, who mean well, who probably know the taste of slavery already. They know how it feels to be a slave to the enemy and they will come with a good word of sense to you. Don't dismiss the help God brings you. It may not come in a flashy show, in a display of splendor, it may come in weakness. It may come through someone who has seen it all. 
but it is the gift of God for your life to spare you from continuing to living in bondage and in scarcity. God wants you whole and he wants you to recover and bring back everything the enemy took from you. But keep your eyes open to that man of peace, to that person that will be instrumental to bring you back. And as I close the story, it says, Then David returned to the brook and met up with the 200 men who had been left behind because they were too exhausted to go with him. They went out to meet David and his men, and David greeted them joyfully. But some evil troublemakers among David's men said, Hey, David, they didn't go out with us, so they can't have any of the plunder we recovered. Give them to their wives and children and tell them to be gone. But David said, No, my brothers, don't be selfish with what the Lord has given us. He's kept us safe, and he's helped us to feed the hand of the raiders that attack, attacked us. Amen? It was the Lord. Don't forget that, my brothers. We didn't win this. It was the Lord who gave us the victory. Who are we to claim the spoil for ourselves? 24, verse 24. Who will listen when you talk like this? We share and we share alike. Those who go to battle and those who guard the equipment. From then on, David made this a decree and a regulation for Israel. And it is still followed today. When he arrived at Ziklag, David sent part of the plunder to the elders of Judah, who were his friends. Here is a present for you taken from the Lord's enemies, he said. The gifts were sent to the people of the following towns. David had visited Bethel, Ramoth Negev, Jatter, Aroer, Shipmoth, Estamoa, Rask, Rakel, and the towns of the Rehamalitites, the towns of Kenites, Horma, Borsham, Atak, Hebron, and all the other places David and his men had visited. I might have slaughtered a few of those names today. The Lord forgive me. <laughs> Lastly, my brothers, when God gives you the victory, don't lose your battle at the mountaintop. If you made it through the valley and now you're in the mountain, don't get prideful in the mountain. Don't lose your victory when you're at the top because many men lose it when they have already won because they stop relying on the Lord. Be humble, remain kind, and be patient with those who would like you to go back in the flesh and do things in your own strength. Remember who gave you the victory. Remember who pays the bills. It's not you. It's the Lord who has given you the ability. Remember who gives you the breath of life. Remember who has taken you out of the place of despair. It's the Lord. So you cannot take his victory and claim it your own and act as if it was you who did it and take it all for you. Don't be selfish. Share what God gives you. When God blesses you, remember who blessed you. When God blesses you, remember that he gave it to you so you can bless others. Everything he gives you is not for you. Everything he gives you, he gives it to you so it comes through you to somebody else. I want every man to stand, please. And I want every man to come here to the front. And I want to bless you. And I want to pray for you. And I want to ask all the women to stand right behind them and form a wall of prayer. Can you do that, please? Extend your hands toward these brothers. We live in a society that is trying to eliminate the role of men. I want you to face towards me, brothers. Thank you, so I can see your eyes. We live in a society that is saying that men are not needed. And I come against that lie because you are needed and you are wanted desperately in your homes. God wants you pure 
He wants you sound. He wants you humble. And He wants you to remain kind. He wants you to seek the Lord. He wants you to pray. He wants you to encourage each other. He doesn't want you to do it alone. You can come to church and still be alone and feel alone. We need to stretch out our hands to each other, just like Colleen is doing. And I want you to do that. Just stretch out your hands and embrace a brother. Because not one man that is connected to this ministry should ever, ever die alone. We're going to stick together and we're going to pray together for the Lord to bless your marriage and to bless your home. I want you to bow your heads and I want you to receive this blessing. Dear Father, thank you for all the women that are going to, from this day on, commit to pray for the men in our church. For their commitment to not rise up in rebellion against the men that you have placed in their life. For the commitment that they will make today to intercede and stand in the gap for them when they feel they don't know what they're doing. For the courage you give them to speak kindness and to speak encouragement when they know they failed. Lord, I ask you, give them a voice that comes from you to speak courage into the heart of my brothers in this day. I pray for the young boys in this semicircle right here in the name of Jesus. I pray that the men of this church will look into these young men and they will speak life and truth into their lives because many of them are angry inside because their father is not at home. And I pray that you will love them through the men of our church. And I pray that you would give a voice to my brothers here to speak life into single mothers, into homes that are in distress. I pray you bless them with health. I pray you bless them with devotion for you. That they will love you with everything inside of them. If there's any unforgiveness or bitterness in any of my brothers here, I pray right now that you will let go of that unforgiveness and that bitterness so that you can be set free. For those of you brothers who were abused verbally at your homes and you felt like trash growing up, I want you to renew your mind and speak the words of God into your heart. And listen to what God says. You are precious in my eyes. You are valuable in my sight. And you are needed in my kingdom. Thank you, Lord. For those sons here who are at odds with their parents, restore that relationship, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Restore that broken relationship and give my brothers the courage to forgive and to be kind to those who have been unkind to them. In the name of Jesus Christ. I ask God's blessing of provision, of health, of a sound mind, a prosperity of a spiritual life in their lives. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Look up at me for just a second, brothers. I love you and I pray for you. And I want you to have eyes to the brothers in this church. We have beautiful people here. Every one of you has, has a story. Some of our younger kids need strong men of God. They need love and loving correction sometimes. I want you to take it upon yourself to help raise some of our young kids. To get involved in their lives. They, they not only need to hear from their earthly fathers, they need to hear from a band of men who can speak the same thing into their lives. So before we leave, I want you to find a man, find a young man, wherever he is 
If you see them wandering away, that's precisely why you need to go find it because this conversation could be very uncomfortable to them because they don't even know how to be loved. They don't know how to be loved. They've never been loved. They've seen demise and brokenness. So, so you hang in there and you look them in the eye and you say, you're, you're hurting, but I love you. God loves you and it's okay. It's okay to cry. It's okay to talk about it. Let's pray about this. Let's get deeper into each other's lives. We're not going to let the devil take away our families. I am committed to fight to the very end. And the enemy has come so close to, to bring my heart into a point where, where I feel I can't do it anymore. Because there's so much pain inside for the loss. But the Lord, every time, listen carefully, he's been faithful and he has given back more than what the enemy took away from us. Every time. Every time. And he'll do the same for you. Love your kid. Love your son. Love your daughter. Ask for forgiveness if you've blown it with your kids. Go. Humbly ask for forgiveness. Tell them that you love them. I love you very much. Go ahead and find somebody and love them. And with that, we close our service. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. Sure. Anna, would you come? Okay. They want to pray for us. Thank you. Dear Lord, I just thank you first and foremost for this day. Many didn't get the option. I thank you for divine intervention and divine appointments and divine friendships. Father God, I thank you for my brother and his wife and this beautiful ministry that you laid out before them. I thank you because, as he stated today, that testimony was hard for him to say. He never told anybody. But you're telling me to let him know that this is the beginning of his true healing all throughout. Those thoughts that still attack the back of his mind are going to be removed and undone, binded and sent back to hell in the name of Jesus. Father God, I just ask that you bless this family from the top of their head to the toes of their feet. I ask that you increase their faith and increase their finances. I ask that you take this ministry, this church, and what you're trying to do, Lord, and take it worldwide. Father God, I ask that you overflow on us. Just flood our nation, these boys, these women that are out here hurting with healing, Father God. I lift my sister and my brother up to you, and I just ask that you fully, fully restore and give them everything that you have for them, Lord. We thank you. We give your name all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Love you guys very much. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Go encourage somebody. Go encourage somebody. Speak it to someone.